Now we have a very special guest for you. His name is Mr. Louis Pouzin, and he's the grandfather of the internet. And he'll be speaking about internet geopolitics. Mr. Pouzin? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Should have taken a hat, <laughs> or maybe sunglasses. <laughs> All right. Good evening, ladies and gents. Are you hungry? Because if you are, you will be hungrier at the end of the speech, you know. <laughs> But I would like to talk this, this evening about a subject that is uh, not really technical, certainly political. I call this subject the geopolitics of internet. In other words, how internet and politics interact at the world level. It's a topic that's been active for the past 15 years at least. <laughs> it's called internet governance, but internet governance is only one aspect of it. It's the official aspect, but the, the backside of it is just politics. <coughs> well, you probably have noticed for the past few years, uh, not just few, but uh, perhaps a dozen years now, that funding for project is difficult. As opposed to the, the years, let's say, between 1980 and 1990, it was relatively easy to get funding for almost everything. <coughs> sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but at least uh, money was available. But now it's no longer available because of crisis. What crisis? Well, we know the crisis has been manufactured by the banks. And what happened? Even though they put, this crisis has put a lot of people out of funds or out of money, out of, high, out the, out of their house also. Who, who got sued for that? Nobody. Just business as usual. The banks are making even more money than ever. The bank executives are um, received in, uh, at the White House. <coughs> so why should they stop? It's obvious that they will do it again. Maybe on a different uh, field. Maybe it won't be the subprime, it will be another, another something. But it's, it's clearly that if there is no if there is no cost uh, to be paid by the banks, they will do it again. And the victims are the taxpayers. You know. <coughs> now, <coughs> there was a time um, when the United States government policy was to dismantle or at least to reduce the, the amount of power which the monopolies would uh, acquire. Perhaps you remember Standard Oil, or you may remember AT&T. Um, those groups were dismantled uh, because they were becoming too powerful. But now the politics has changed. The big, the big industrial groups are useful for the US government dominance. They help the U.S. country to be stronger around the world. In other words, even though it may not be uh, beneficial to the American consumers, it is beneficial for the U.S. as a whole because it, it increases their power. And therefore, it's absolutely no question that uh, Apple, Google, 
uh, Amazon, eBay, and so on will never be dismantled, even though they're quasi-monopolies. <coughs> In other words, at the moment, the lobbies are kings. And they are, since the, the US is the most powerful country, that means the US lobbies are the most powerful lobbies. They operate in uh, almost every country in the world, not necessarily in China, but they operate wherever they are not outlawed. outlawed. And they are, they are what we call too big, too big to be, um, to be crushed. Subprime was an example. If, it, if the banks had failed in the US, the whole economy would have been totally um, out, of, out of business. In other words, those, those uh, dinosaurs are now a part of our life. We have to live with them. Now, an interesting thing, too, which may be noticed, is that all these uh, worldwide uh, monopolies don't pay taxes. They use uh, tricky, um, tricky arrangements whereby if you, uh, if you declare your headquarters in one country, you make profit in another country, and then you shift the profit in a third country, and then take it back to the U.S. by uh, cleverly arranging that, that itinerary, they don't pay taxes. And that's billions of dollars, which are made on the consumers abroad in other countries. In other words, they, uh, they should be partially returned to the countries where the business was, was uh, operated. But they're not. <laughs> so that's, in a way, you know, you might call that some kind of uh, uh, kind of racket. Well, officially, legally, it's not a racket because the legislation allows to do that. But they are the only ones to be able to take advantage of it because they have the appropriate ex expert staff to do it, and they have enough money to have a bunch of lawyers to find out the loopholes. <laughs> now, we have lobbies, but we also have the government of the United States, which is in a way is also imposing its will on most other, most other countries, not all of them, but a good number of them. For example, the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was, I think, uh, was uh, voted uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I'm not sure. It was voted, uh, I guess, after 9-11. And it gives extraordinary power to the government, to the administration, I would should say, other than the government. In other words, it does not usually involve the, representant, the representative of the people. It involves essentially the apparatchiks in the, the, apparatchiks in the administrations. So they have immense power to track people, um, take them to jail if they want to, uh, not giving any reason why they've been put them to jail. And uh, if they're later released, after a year or two or more, no explanation, no compensation, nothing. So what's the difference with China? Now, <coughs> another approach that which has been taken presently by the U.S. government is treaties. When it comes to business, there are a number of international organizations, for example, the, um, the World Trade Organization, or the, the, the World Intellectual Property Organization, in which a lot of powerful countries are members. And therefore, they have to discuss, they try to make rules. They don't call that laws, but they call that regulations. And uh, in that context, um, everyone is supposed to play the game. 
Of course, like in any game, there are people cheating. And I would say most countries at some point or another are trying to cheat a little bit, but not too obviously. Because then if someone is cheating too much, first, it could cost them a huge, uh, huge fines. But also it could be possibly excluded from the organization. So they have to play it safe. And therefore it's a it's sort of a mechanism whereby excessive behavior are maintained in a reasonable balance. That's something the US do, the US doesn't like. Because because precisely they're limited in the kind of uh, excess they could do, they prefer arrangement in which they can do whatever they want. And they usually uh, have uh, try, uh, are using now treaties. Treaties mean arrangements uh, signed between a limited number of countries. They usually start with the countries which are the most dependent on the, on the US government. Typically, you know, you have uh, Canada, uh, UK, um, Australia, Japan, and Israel. Um, those are countries which are usually in line with what the, the US government wants to do. So they start by negotiation. Negotiation, those negotiations are secret. Even though uh, the US government is often complaining that some discussions, for example, in ITU, are secret. Well, they're not secret in ITU. They're just reserved to governments. And every government man can, can, uh, di di can uh, dispatch them or can make them known if they want to. So they're not really secret. But the treaties are much more secret because they are negotiated with a limited number of people um, it's not within the framework of an organization. It's just something ad hoc, which is created for the purpose of uh, getting a treaty, a, tr a treaty signed. And once a treaty has been signed, then they try to get other countries within the same treaty by sort of uh, uh, <coughs> putting, making the ball growing like a snowball. You know. Well, they tried that last year, for example. They tried that uh, with ACTA. You may not know what ACTA is. Well, it was a, a treaty which was supposed to be signed by the whole world. It was not. But it, it started as a, as a proposal for most major countries with a definite objective of preventing illegal downloading on the internet. In other words, in order to, in order to limit the amount of so-called illegal downloading, they wanted to make all, all downloading suspicious and get the countries to sign a treaty whereby they would be forced to act on those downloading without necessarily discovering that they're illegal, but means they're a priori, they would be considered as suspicious and therefore being tracked, people being identified, getting, uh, um, getting warning letters and so on. That treaty was almost to be signed by Europe. The European Commission wanted very strongly to have this treaty signed. Why is it so? It's because the European Commission is under uh, the influence of the media lobby, just like in the United States. So they wanted that treaty to be approved. But the European Parliament had a different opinion. They rejected, with a strong majority, the treaty. And he was uh, in the procedure for validating the treaty, it should, been, it should have been approved by the parliaments, by every country in, the, in Europe. But the European Parliament took the initiative to say, no, we don't want it. 
So it was killed. But what happened? It's a little bit like the sorcerer apprentice. Um, we kill a treaty. Next year, you get five or six different treaties being negotiated. They're about the same ones. They take about the same regulations. They try to get simultaneously a variety of treaties which are negotiated with different countries in order to, let's say, in order to mask out this negotiation because the more treaty you have to follow, there is, a, there is a limited number of people available to follow that, to, to, to be busy um, following those negotiations. So they dilute their capacity to be reactive. For example, at the moment, we have the TPP or something like that, maybe it's TAPP or something. It's a transatlantic, um, transatlantic partnership uh, something. It's about the same as ACTA, as far as we know, because it's secret. So we don't know the details, but some, some, some documents have been leaked, as, as it usually happens. It turns out it's about the same kind of stuff. But now, countries, European countries, uh, know the tricks. They are much less sensitive to sign that. In other words, the more the, more the US and its allies are becoming more ex expert in negotiating those treaties, the more the countries which don't want those treaties are also becoming more expert in killing them. <laughs> So we have a sort of cat and mouse game at the moment, which is likely to, to continue for a number of years. So <clears throat> what should we do? You know, it's, uh, it's an enormous capacity of, uh, of uh, those lobbies and, and the uh, United States hyperpower is quite difficult to, man to contain. However, there should be some ways for us citizens. You know, you cannot, you cannot fight the military, they have the power. You cannot fight the, the, the politicians because they're usually also uh, supported by the lobbies. You cannot fight the lobbies. Well, what, what can you fight? Well, when you have no power, you have the internet. That's something that was not available in the past. In the past, once the lobbies had the, the last word, there was not much the, the people can do in any country. Well, they could make a revolution. It happens too. But the revolution is, doesn't happen every year. You know, it happens occasionally every 10, 50, uh, 100 years perhaps. And it's very costly in terms of people's life, uh, the chaos that comes after the revolution. So that's not the best way at the moment to control things. But the internet turns out to be a much better way of controlling things. For example, ACTA was killed by uh, the European Parliament. But how is it that the Parliament rejected ACTA? Well, they rejected ACTA because there had been massive petitions uh, circulated within the internet. More than one million people had signed uh, to reject that treaty. Well, when it comes to that figures, to those figures, the politicians are getting worried. They're getting worried because they, they, are, they start really feeling that the country is against them. And if they, if they keep pushing the adoption of those uh, treaties, they may suffer at the next election because the, the newspapers and the internet will publish what, what was the vote of Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so. And when it comes to election, they make a list of you voted for, you voted against, and so on. So it, uh, it certainly has an influence on, on their potential for being re-elected. And what's, uh, that's what they're mo the most worried about, is being re-elected. You know. So they, they pay much more attention to massive petitions than they would if you won't write to your representative. <clears throat> so that's uh, the power of the internet is in multiply 
by the millions the capacity of individual citizens. And uh, another example happened in, uh, also last year in the United States. It was called SOPA. SOPA was the American version of ACTA. In other words, it was sort of playground, which was again um, focused on suing people who were doing um, supposedly illegal downloading on the net. Apparently, according to the, um, to the polls, uh, SOPA should have been adopted quite easily by most of the Republicans and about one, at least half the Democrats. So it was a sure thing. And then a petition was launched. Again, more than one million signatures. And further than that, a large number of of websites, which are very popular. For example, Google search, for example, Wikipedia, and a lot of private uh, websites either turned black or had a banner on the screen explaining that they really um, are against, up against uh, SOPA. In a matter of two or three days, a good number of Republicans and almost more of the Democrats switched their minds. And that was clearly the effect of the petition. So this, this, uh, this mechanism is quite powerful. It cannot be overdone, of course. If people start making petitions uh, at the rate of uh, once a day, for example, then it's too much because the, the citizens won't pay attention anymore. It has to be carefully targeted on critical subjects. It has to be orchestrated for a certain number of weeks. It has to be uh, carefully um, written. And uh, that takes time and money. You, you cannot have all the all, all volu only volunteers to do that. So it's very powerful as long as it's reasonably used, but not excessively used. Now, <coughs> you might say, well, let's do that. Well, it's certainly possible to do that in many countries which are called democratic, even though it's not clear. For example, in the, at the moment, uh, many countries are trying to filter out of the internet opinions they don't like. Well, it's not legal, really. They uh, are arresting journalists. You probably have heard recently about the, the documents uh, that the Guardian, the British Guardian, had collected from uh, Snowden. The journalists were harassed by the UK government. One of them was detained nine hours in the Heathrow Airport. Um, no, legal, no legal justification for that. The journalists are supposed to be protected by laws, but they are arrested, in fact. And they are lucky, because in other countries they would be in jail. So even though there are good laws to protect the freedom of, ex of expression, it turns out that in many countries, freedom of expression is just uh, something of the past. You know? <clears throat> so it's dangerous, you know, being um, reacting against positions decided either by government or their lobbies may be dangerous. May be dangerous for your business, for your reputation, for your family, and so on, and for your money, of course. <clears throat> That not not something we can use uh, without um, without warning. <clears throat> well, now you've heard also, of course, like everybody else, you've heard of prism. Prism, uh, it's a, a sort of band, a sort of brand which has been stuck on the system built by the NSA to spy on practically everyone in the world, even China. Even, you know, even the, even the, um, the uh, Na United Nations, even the European uh, Commission, everywhere. So you might say that unless you're totally 
uh, irrelevant, unimportant, you're probably spied like, like everyone else. You know, the NSA is doing, they, they copy, they copy everything that's transmitted on the backbones of the net. Even the, even the submarine cables, even though they are wrapped into a lot of uh, isolation, protection against all kinds of animals, they still radiate some energy. And this is picked up by the, the clever, um, the clever uh, equipment that the NASA is able to plant nearby the cables. So it's, in, and it's always difficult to escape that. Satellites, of course, are open to everyone. Anything that's on land can be tapped relatively easily. So the, 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 the NSA at the moment has a practically unlimited capacity for recording everything that's transmitted, not just the internet. But when you make a plain phone call, for example, you can be traced, you can be recorded. So that's something new, something never happened in the past on the Earth. Again, what to do? Well, a number of governments, a number of governments are supposedly um, exfuriated, ex supposedly very angry about that, but actually it's mostly a posture because they knew that for a long time. This spy by the, the NSA has been published in the United States by the uh, New York Times in 2005. The origin was a leak. An AT&T engineer called Mark Klein had observed that in some, some of the AT&T offices, there were a bunch of cables um, coming, which were hooked onto the backbones of the communication system, not just the internet, but any communication that was using the backbone, multiplex, voice, data, images, anything. And this, is, this was rerouted, this was copied and sent to the NSA. It was a secret room in which only NSA uh, technicians could, uh, could enter. So he published a report it took him about six months to get a newspaper in the United States to publish that, which means the, the freedom of expression, even though it's legal, is carefully monitored or filtered by, by the press, by the media themselves. So finally it was published. And the Electronic, F F Electronic um, Frontier Foundation also sued the US government to get those documents published. <coughs> so there are some possibility to react against it, but it's, it's one drop of water in an ocean. So now with the, the level uh, reached by things like PRISM, it's just out of reach. Too many, too many things should be, um, should be uh, recovered or, uh, or destroyed. That never happened. When such when when an armada of equipment has been installed, it stays around. No, even though it would declare illegal, it would still be around. It would still be used. Too late. In other words, those kind of things are much harder to eliminate if they are discovered too late, and if the if the people in the countries do not react sufficiently in time. When I say the people, I mean people who act as citizens. Or they may be businessmen in, in other, uh, with different hats. They may be uh, political people, religious people, artist people, and so on, it doesn't matter. As long as they can act as citizens. Our citizens know the constitution, they know the laws. A number of the uh, citizens are lawyers. Well, they are usually, if they want to, if they have the, the if they have the, the will, well, they can uh, create, they can mount a, a sort of a, uh, a, a file against the, the behavior of the, either the government or the lobbies. That takes time, takes money, 
But if it's well done, it, it can be successful. Or well, suddenly it will be difficult, but they, it finally gets, gets that, uh, sufficiently heard by the political people. Now, there are still one thing, another thing that the, we can do with the internet. You know, the uh, internal citizens, whether we call them hackers or just citizens or just uh, aware citizens, they know encryption. No, some encryption is supposedly not crackable by modern means. Anything is, can be uh, cracked after a number of years when computer speed becoming faster, when the capa memory capacity become larger. So anything probably can be cracked after 10 or 15 years. But at the moment, there are some encryption techniques which are not, as far as we know, uh, crackable. But they are perfectly uh, implementable there are chips to do that, software. It can be done on uh, regular computers. Encryption is much easier to do than um, decryption. Oh, <coughs> no, cracking a code is much harder than uh, encoding. So uh, my feeling is that citizens will have to protect their communications just the same way as they protect their private life or their business. Encryption will have to become a sort of a routine procedure to limit the capacity of the illegal operation of superpowers. <coughs> but this is not peculiar to the United States, you know. A lot of countries, even though maybe they may be underdeveloped countries, are doing the same. They're not doing the same, maybe not, uh, not the same means, but a lot of equipment used by the NSA is on the market. It can be bought by any other country. And you might say that most European countries of a certain size, most African countries which have uh, revenues in oil, for example, uh, most uh, Middle East countries which are dictatorship, of course, China, Russia, so on, India. Well, they do the same. They may not do it as efficiently. They may not have all the equipment that's necessary. They may not have all the expertise that's necessary, but they are just following, following the way that's being opened by the United States. So we, we have to consider that now the virus, I mean the, the illness, is in the world. It's like AIDS. You know. We cannot get rid of it, you know. <coughs> and even though we don't have a, a, a formal way or a, a magic way of getting rid of it, we have to be protected against it. <coughs> now, it has implications for um, a number of businesses. For example, in the recent, in the recent weeks, there has been a considerable number of uh, remarks um, comments in the in the U.S. Uh, newsletters about the massive loss of business that they will that they will have to suffer in the cloud because they they intended to sell their cloud services to the, the whole world and now the motto now the the mantra is. Don't store your sensitive data in the United States anymore, you know. Because you have no way to protect them there. The US government has all the right to spy on them without telling you. Therefore, find some other place. But where? Is there a safe place in the world? Like a bank. What is a safe bank? Right, it's a big one. Well, it's a bank which is sufficiently sufficiently uh, small size so that they are not interested, not interesting for the for the uh, criminals. But I guess there is no real safe place to save to save your data. The only safe way to do is to put some in different places with enough duplication. 
knowing that someday or another, part of it will be probably uh, discovered, perhaps stolen or altered. And that's the danger we'll have to live with again. You now the, the safe boxes are no longer um, guaranteed. <coughs> So that's something we have to organize. We're not used to do that. It's boring. You know, we don't want to be bothered with all these protection systems, encryption, moving data around. We have to also be um, worry about loss of identity, stealing identity. That's now a, a game which is uh, not so not so un un uh, uh, unfrequent. <coughs> Now, of course, uh, this kind of, this kind of uh, future is not very attractive. Living in a perpetual anxiety of being uh, hampered, being destroyed, being stolen, that's not pleasant. And the, this has been the case for many things in the past. Um, I don't, I don't talk about the atomic bomb because it was sufficiently, sufficiently unique that uh, it's not a good example. But for example, poison gas. Poison gas, which was used in the, in the First World War in Europe. It was introduced by the Germans. Well, they've never been used anymore in, in the following wars. They've been used in some, in some countries in which the war was against their own citizens, like Iraq, for example. And perhaps Syria, but we're not quite sure. So why is it not used anymore? Because we had, because the United Nations, all the countries were, uh, had, had agreed that this kind, of, uh, this kind of weapon was much too dangerous. Not much too dangerous and really unacceptable because almost, almost every country could use those weapons, at least in limited quantity. So poison gas were forbidden. Now, there are other things which are partially forbidden, for example, fragmentation bombs. The United States has not signed that, that treaty anymore, any, any longer. But we should simultaneously, but that's not something that ordinary citizens can do. No, put pressure on their own government, on their own representative, so that at the United Nations level, we should prohibit things like mass surveillance. Mass surveillance is absurd. You know, trying to track and spy on a, a billion of people for perhaps uh, a dozen potential uh, criminals or even less. Criminals are becoming extremely clever, and they will probably escape most of the surveillance. The people who will be, who will be uh, attacked and the people who will be uh, really um, hampered by those systems are the ones which are uh, unintentionally or uh, erroneously sued for something they haven't done. <coughs> so this kind of thing probably should be in the list of things which should be prohibited. Now, there are probably others, but that's uh, up, to, up to us to find out what should be prohibited officially. Well, it's not guaranteed that it will be immediately Im implemented. You know, laws may take some time to get really respected. But that's a progress. Now, um, slavery, slavery is also prohibited even though it's still active in many parts of the, perhaps Africa, perhaps Middle East, and so on. Well, it's illegal, but it's still practice. But it's limited. It's no longer the way it used to be at the Roman time or in the uh, 18th century's time with the uh, African being shipped to the United States and so on. Well, that's, that's finished now. But it took, it took many years. And therefore, we have to expect that anything we want to improve uh, with, uh, the ap with the agreement of all the countries and the United Nations will take several dozens of years. But it has to be done somehow. So pu putting pressure on the politicians is necessary. 
It also has to be relayed by the press, by uh, people who are good writers, authors, and, and also occasionally by big demonstrations, <coughs> like petitions or that sort of thing. So I guess we have to get organized to live differently. Even though as, uh, as experts, specialists, technicians, we are not very tempted to get involved in those dirty political things. Well, that's the, it, that depends what you, what you have in mind for your, for your family, for your, for your children. In other words, the people who will live after you, or I mean live uh, in your, in your uh, older age, what life do you want they have? If uh, we don't take a precaution, it's like an, it's like an insurance contract. Why are you taking an insurance contract? Well, to protect from excessive or accidental or grave or difficult or uh, circumstances in which you wouldn't be able to, um, to take over uh, your, your uh, mis mishap. So I think getting involved at some point in the politics is necessary, uh, just an insurance for the future of your, of your species of your uh, human uh, families and of your, uh, of your business, uh, of your taste, of your, uh, your traditions. Uh, the, in other words, protect, the, the, protect the, the life the way you want it. <coughs> now that's uh, gradually, of course, it won't happen uh, overnight. But I think we, we have to be aware of that and spend some time to do it. After all, we spend some time to do a lot of things which are not necessarily essential. They may be pleasant, but uh, even though it's, uh, it's some, somehow unpleasant to put your hands in the dirty political things, um, it can be done at some, at some level without getting too much. You know, again, everybody has limits to, to what they can do, but it's necessary. And, um, uh, make, you know, make also, when there is a, an election, when there is a vote, a big vote, uh, recruit people and, and so on, and uh, make sure everybody is aware, uh, informed about the real issues and what they can do to uh, limit the um, abnormal capacity of um, government and lobbies. Now, I might as well stop here. It's almost 45 minutes. So thank you for um, listening. I hope you will have anyway a good life, even though it may require a little bit more effort than in the past. And have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs>